there's no one more worthy of all worship. And that's why we can continue to sing. seated. Well, good morning, Central family. Welcome to the first Sunday of the new year. What a blessing it is to be here, isn't it? And for those of you that are unfamiliar with it, that bright orange ball in the sky is the sun. So when you go out, be careful to shield your eyes. It's been so long since we've seen it, you're liable to be shocked by it. So just a word of caution, all right? Hey, if you have your Bible, Lamentations chapter 3 is where we are. I want to First of all, welcome, uh, welcome those who are watching us via live stream. Uh, you may not be aware of it, but we have started a new venture officially today. Uh, we are no longer on our Suddenlink channel. Now we are streaming live, so there is no safety net of an editor later to fix any mistakes that I might make or to make me look better. Uh, it's a good thing. That's lost cause anyway. Uh, but our live streaming audience, if you're watching, from wherever you might be, we welcome you and we thank you for being here. We'd love to hear from you. Drop us a line on our, on our Facebook page or through our website. We'd be delighted to hear from you and we thank you for joining us. Lamentations chapter 3. This is another new day. I've never actually preached from Lamentations. So you're here on a special day. How about that? And Lamentations is a book that doesn't often get used at a happy time. Uh, primarily because it's not a happy book. Uh, Lamentations is a book filled with exactly what the title proclaims it to be. Laments, sorrows, griefs, written presumably by Jeremiah, whom we call the weeping prophet. It is a book filled with the sorrows that he experienced. When you read through it all the way through, you'll find pieces of why is this happening, God? Where are you in the midst of my struggle? Where are you in the midst of my suffering? I thought you'd promised me something, and yet I'm struggling to understand it. I want to know how this fits into your grand plan. If you've asked any of those questions in your lifetime, or if you've asked any of those questions in the last few months, you're in good company. You're in good company. For it seems to me these last few months of 2015, we had a great deal of drama, excitement, for some of us, even trauma. You see, it's not gone without notice that we have many who are sick. We have others who have been involved in accidents. Still others who are experiencing financial calamities. Still others who are struggling with their marriage or their home, their children, and it is incredible to me that all of these things sort of come together. And we've, maybe it's just that we've heard about more of them lately, or maybe it's just that now is a season where those things are happening. So as we begin this new year, I don't want us to take up Jeremiah's laments. I want us to take up Jeremiah's words in Lamentations 3. For you see, right in the middle almost dead center of this lamenting book is a passage where Jeremiah wakes up and he reminds himself that there are some things that are true. There are some things that are bigger than circumstance, bigger than situation, bigger than calamity. There are some things that are true. And those things that are true are things you can anchor to and hold on to and be confident in when the storm does rage. So with that in mind, 
Let's stand and we'll read from Lamentations chapter 3, starting in verse 22 through verse 24. The Bible reads like this. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait for him. Pray with me, won't you? With humility, Lord Jesus, we come to you bringing this new year. And we say to you, Lord Jesus, thank you that you've brought it to us. I pray, Father God, for those in our midst who are struggling, who have health issues, who have financial issues, who are struggling with family issues. We ask, Father God, that you would meet each need according to your strength. Specifically, Lord, we want to lift up Catherine Jacobson. We want to lift up Bo, and we thank you today, Father. You can meet both of those needs. And we thank you today, Father God, that even if our need isn't one we've called out specifically, you can meet it too. We ask, Lord Jesus, that you would speak to us in this time of study and that you would help us, Father God, to find in you the faithfulness that Jeremiah found. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. You know, here's the thing. The reason that I chose this passage for us today, that I feel like the Lord took me to this passage, is because I want us to start the year with the end in mind. What do I mean by that? Well, let's say we're going on a trip, and we decide we want to go somewhere. So what we do is we decide this is the location we want to get to, this particular designation right here. We want to get here. But the reality is that we're way back over here. So what we want to do is we want to start at the end. We want to start where we, wind, where we want to wind up, and we want to draw a line from there back to where we are and say, okay, this is is how I'm going to get there. And along the path, I don't know what's going to happen, but I know that at the end, I'm going to wind up there. That's precisely what we know in the Word of God. For those of us that are believers, and I hope that's all of you, and if it isn't, invite Jesus into your life today, and you can join us in this confidence, that the reality is this future that we have right here as believers, it's already set. We can already be sure of it. And so at the beginning of this new year, I want to tell you one thing right now. God is good. God is awesome. He is on his throne. There's no situation that will surprise him. There's nothing that will scare him. He is well in charge of every aspect of our lives, and his love is enough to see us through whatever 2016 brings. Now there is where we're going, all right? That's where we want to go, and that's the end that we have. Now, draw a line from there backwards to wherever you are. For some of us, it's not easy to see that end, is it? There are things that are blocking our sight, and those things get large, don't they? I want us to begin with the end in mind. So with that, find in your bulletin that you got when you came through the door, the note sheet. I want to encourage you to take that out and jot down a couple of notes because there are some things I think the Lord has, has given me that perhaps will benefit you sometime during this coming year. Let's start with Roman numeral one. God's faithfulness to you is forever. See it there in verse 22 again. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning great is your faithfulness so the preeminent quality of god his primary character quality is faithfulness constancy 
He is who he's promised to be and always will be. There's something to get excited about right there. Because nothing else is that way, is it? Everything else changes, even under our feet. Have you ever stood in the sand at the beach and tried to stand in one place as the water came past and washed the sand out from underneath your feet? And you're like, doggone it, I stood on that sand because I wanted to stand on that sand. And now it's changing right under my feet. Well, all of us live life that way, don't we? Man, there are a lot of changes headed our way in 2016. We can't see all of them, but we can know this. God's faithfulness to you is forever. As I thought about this, I thought about a picture that I found not too long ago. Bring that picture up and take the lights down because I want to make sure that everybody gets full effect on this picture. I don't know where this picture was taken. Don't really care, to be honest with you. But I want, I want to tell you, when I see this picture, I'm like, holy mackerel, we serve an incredibly creative God. A God who hung every one of those stars in place and a God who knows them each by name. We have a God who is so creative and so imaginative and so loving that not only did he hang those stars and call them each by name, but he allows us to stand under his sky and be awed at his creation. That's remarkable. But here's what's even more remarkable. The same God that hung those stars, that knows each one of them by name and walks with us, knows us by name too. You can bring the lights back up. Here's what I want you to remember first. When I say God's faithfulness to you is forever, I don't mean it in a theoretical sense. I mean it for you specifically. God's faithfulness to you is forever. Where you are, who you are. You might say, oh, but oh, Darren, you don't know, man. Some of the things that happened this year, it's I, I got to tell you, Darren, there's some things that have happened that I really wish they hadn't. I made some mistakes. I want to throw a few things out, you, out to you under this first Roman numeral that I've got there. First of all, our sin cannot break God's faithfulness. Nothing you can do can deter God's faithfulness. There's nothing so bad, so awful, so grievous, that you can run God off. You can't sin bad enough to break his faithfulness. Isn't that great news? It means that because of God and his character, he's not scared off by any choices that you might make. See it there again in verses 22 and 24, or 23. Because of the Lord's great love. Oh, huh, underline that. The Lord's great love. Not my love for him, but his great love for me. Because of the Lord's great love, we're not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They're new every morning. I don't know if you've had a night like this, but there have been a couple of nights in, in my life where it seemed like the darkness hung on or the darkness just wouldn't seem to go away, or the heaviness of the night seemed like that darkness wouldn't ever go and the sun wouldn't shine. I don't know if you've ever had a moment in time like that, but I'm here to tell you today that, yes, just as faithful as the sunrise, so is God in his faithfulness to you. And your sin and my sin cannot break God's faithfulness. There is no, no sin that you can commit that will keep God from loving you. He has set his heart upon you. So says John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave. He gave. You didn't earn it. He gave it. So if you didn't earn it in the first place, there's nothing you can do to take it away. Our sin cannot break God's faithfulness. Secondly, our situation does not deter God's faithfulness. I brought another picture with me I want you to see. This one is of a dead-end sign. 
Now, when I saw this picture, I was kind of troubled by it because, you know, this road doesn't look like a dead-end road, does it? It looks like there's a lot more past it. After all, I don't know who put that sign there. Maybe they're just wanting me not to come down that way and see all the glorious, wonderful riches that are at the end of this road. So instead of trusting that sign, I'm going to drive on past it. Because after all, what do they know? They're not the boss of me. I don't have to listen to them. Sometimes we treat God that way, don't we? He puts up signs and says, don't go this way. It's a dead-end path. And we say, hey, God, I don't have to listen to that. You're not the boss of me. I can do whatever I want. I don't have to listen to your dead-end sign. And so we create situations for ourselves that cause us to question whether or not God is faithful. Well, this is an argument I've gotten a couple of times. If God is so faithful, if he's so good, then why didn't he stop me from making a mess out of my life in the first place? You know, here's what I've learned. Nothing is foolproof to a sufficiently motivated fool. <laughs> Have you noticed that too? Because a sufficiently motivated fool will find a way to defeat anything that's foolproof. I have been that sufficiently motivated guy before, but I want to call to your attention that it doesn't have to be that way. Our situation does not deter God's faithfulness. Just because we've walked our way down that road and gotten to that dead-end sign doesn't mean that God's going, oh, man, I didn't know that was coming. What are we going to do now? Nor does he stand in fear of it. Our situation does not deter God's faithfulness. So here's a third thing I want to throw at you. Our ability to earn God's faithfulness isn't a part of the equation. Our ability to earn God's faithfulness isn't a part of the equation. Some people say, hey, you know what? I'll, I know what I'll do. I'll wait to come to God. I'll wait to get my life right until I've cleaned myself up. After all, I've got to earn my way into his presence. If you have to earn it, then you won't ever get there. Consider this, this uh, scene from Saving Private Ryan, a movie that I don't necessarily condone, but it's one that I've seen, and this scene in particular is a, a one worth mentioning. Tom Hanks's character, the actor on the left, is, uh, was sent on a mission to find Private Ryan. Several of his brothers had already been killed, and he was to be given a trip home. He was to be sent home. So he, Captain Hanks, and his band of, of uh, other, other searchers went looking for Matt Damon. And through a great deal of travail and circumstance, they finally find him. Several men were killed in the process. And at this particular scene, Captain Hanks has been mortally wounded and is near death. He grabs Matt Damon's character by the scruff of his neck and says to him with some of his final words, earn this. Deserve this sacrifice. Do something with your life that is remarkable. If you've seen the movie, you, you understand what happens from there. So I, if you haven't, I won't ruin it for you. But I will say this. That is a charge that none of us can live up to. The sacrifice that Christ made for us is not something we can ever earn or deserve. And so the best thing we can do is stop trying. See it in verse 22 and 23 again. Where in those verses does it talk about our role in God's faithfulness? It doesn't. This is based on his character. Who God is is not contingent on our response. Who God is is not based on our ability to earn it. It's based on him. And so when things come crashing in in 2016, and they probably will, then turn back to the faithful God who carried you that far. Here's the second thing I want to throw at you, second, Roman numeral number two. Our response to God's faithfulness is trust-filled patience. Our response to God's faithfulness is trust-filled patience. Verse 24, I say to myself, 
The Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait for him. I hate to wait. Anybody with me there? I am the worst waiting person you've probably ever seen, especially behind somebody who won't go at a red light. You know what the definition of a split second is, don't you? It's the length of time between when the light turns green and the driver behind you honks. That would be me behind you going, hey! We all have things we need to do, but I want you to see in verse 24, our response to God's faithfulness is not action. We think we should be busy for God, but I want you to see God is not asking us to be busy. He's asking us to be patient. And what is it that we're waiting for? We're waiting for him to do what only he can. I will wait for him. Sometimes we begin to get concerned because we don't see what we think we ought to. Let me just call to your attention, what you see isn't always what you get. In other words, our eyes can deceive us. And when they do, generally speaking, we allow our eyes to lead us a place that God is not calling. Consider this for a moment. Take a look at these jelly donuts. This is cruel to do you right before lunch, I know. And it was cruel to do the first service because they hadn't gotten to Sunday school with all these donuts yet. So don't feel picked on. Now, I don't know what's in those jelly donuts. But you know what? If they were on a plate right here, I'd probably take one and take my chances and say, hey, I'll take that risk, risky though it may be. I want to ask you, though, if you've ever heard of the game Bean Boozled, rather popular game right now. It's a game played with jelly beans. Only these jelly beans are not your average everyday jelly beans. They're jelly beans that are made by a particular manufacturer for this game specifically. And they're beans that look a lot alike, but they don't taste alike. You just don't know what you're going to get. That green one, it might be lime flavored, but it might be flavored like lawn clippings. That black one, it might be licorice, or it might be just maybe skunk spray. That green and yellow one, it might be caramel flavored, or it might be booger flavored. <laughs> you don't know. The object of the game is to take your chances, pick it up and put it in your mouth, and then find out. Some of you are going, I'm out already. I'm not going to take that chance. But this is why it's so popular, because people record their loved ones playing this game and getting one of those ill-flavored ones, and their response is exactly the one that you've offered. Oh, that's nasty. But I want to tell you this, because frankly, that's how we approach and what happens to us as we live our lives. We don't know what's coming. We take it as it comes. There's only one part that we can be sure of, and that's the faithfulness of God. So what I'm saying to you is don't trust your eyes. Trust what God has promised. Here's another thing that I want you to consider with me. In the dark, trust demands patience. Darkness. It can be scary, can't it? You know, uh, having a four-year-old in the house, I don't really think much about darkness myself anymore, but... My son does. And when the sun goes down and the lights go off, all of a sudden the monsters come out. Have you noticed that? Some of you have children in your house. You know exactly what I'm talking about. And then comes the bargaining. My son is going to be a lawyer, I believe, because he's a wonderful negotiator. I will do this, Daddy, if you'll lay down with me now. I will... He'll, he'll sign anything you want over to, uh, over to you if you just are willing to do what he's asking in the dark. In the daylight, it's a completely different game because there's something pervasive about the dark. In the dark, trust what God said in the light. It demands patience. It demands trust. It demands that we hang on to the anchor points that we set down before. 
What anchor points did we set down? That God is good, that he's faithful, that he's loving, that he's graceful, that he offers you a second chance time and time again. It reminds me, in this particular thought, of Matthew chapter 8, when Jesus has been through a, a season of ministry and they get in the boat and they start out across the lake and Jesus is tired and so he lays down to rest and he's sleeping and a storm rises up while they're on the Sea of Galilee and that storm begins to toss the boat and they get worried, they get afraid. They've got the master of the universe in the boat, but they, instead of trusting him, they get to, to, to doing their own thing. And, and what happens? Finally, they, they appeal to him and they say, Jesus, wake up and help us. Can't you see we're going to drown? Now, what if they had started there instead of ending there? The story would have been very different, wouldn't it? So they wake Jesus up. We're going to drown. And Jesus stands up and speaks to the winds and the waves and just says, peace. Peace. I don't think he meant that just for the wind and the waves. I think he meant it for the disciples too. I think he means it for you as well. Peace, he says. Peace. Rest. In the dark, trust enough to wait. Corey Ten Boom, the great Dutch missionary from the middle part of the 20th century, said this, there's no pit so deep that God's love is not deeper still. So she also had a great analogy about the problem that we really have with wanting to see where we're going, wanting to know what our future holds. She, she said this, the problem is perspective, what we see versus what God sees. It is as if we are faced with a tapestry where God, the master worker, works from his side where he sees how the picture all fits together. But we or on the backside, where it looks like a mass of strings that make no sense whatsoever. We must trust the great artist that he is working to accomplish his purposes and to create the picture that he has in mind for our lives. In the trust, in the dark, trust demands patience. Lastly, confidence lies in the promiser's character. 1 Timothy chapter 2 says this, If we are faithless, God will remain faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Now I want you to take your Bible and turn over to Isaiah chapter 43. I don't want you to just take my word for it. I don't want you just to see it on the screens. I want you to take your Bible and turn over here because I want to talk to you about the promiser's character, who he is and what he's promised to do. Because I want to tell you, when things happen in 2016, and they will, that you didn't expect, that you didn't plan for, be it a health issue, a financial issue, an emotional issue, a family issue, an issue with your children, when, whatever that thing might be, I want you to be able to go back to this and go, be able to go, I remember what God promised. In Isaiah chapter 43, just a couple of books earlier, this is what the Bible says. Isaiah 43, verse 18, forget the former things. Don't dwell on the past. See, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Don't you perceive it? I'm making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. Ha-ha! Like Jeremiah, our friend Isaiah was a, post, a, a pre-exilic prophet. He was one who lived prior to 723 B.C. God is, uh, is about to do something with his people that is difficult for us to understand. It's difficult for us to hear. It's difficult for us to receive. But I want to tell you, God's good enough to carry him through it, and that's what the word is that Isaiah is doing. I'm doing a new thing, he says. Trust me. Trust me. Isaiah 43, he says, hey, that's who I have been. Now jump down to Romans chapter 5, verses 7 and 8, because I want you to see this too. Who is this one who has fulfilled all these promises? Because the ultimate fulfillment of the promise is in the cross. The empty tomb to follow. The price paid for us. The promiser's character is reflected best by the sacrifice he is willing to make for us. 
Romans 5, verse 7 says this, Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's the promiser's character. It's not about us, it's about him. It's not about our love for him, it's about his love for us. So when things come crashing in and you begin to say, I haven't done enough for God, realize that that's not why this has happened. It's because of who God is that he's going to see you through it. Well, his timing is kind of weird, Darren. I don't get it. I don't understand. Yeah, me neither. But I'm going to trust what Galatians 4 says. Galatians 4, verse 4 says this. But when the time, set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship we might be made his. Woo, now we're getting good. Because the reality is, for those of us with children, there's no price we're unwilling to pay to make sure they're well cared for, to make sure their needs are met, and to make sure that they are sheltered. If we as human parents feel that way, how much more does God feel that way about us? As a perfect father, he calls us to himself. So what is the final word then? What is the beginning with the end? The end is this. God is faithful. And in his faithfulness, he keeps his promises. And what are those promises? To be with us every step of the way, to meet every need, not want, but need that we have, and to stand victoriously over it all at the last day. Pray with me, won't you?